Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar titled Cr Criminal Justice, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and People with Mental Illnesses, sponsored by SAMHSA and presented under TA Coalition contract by the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. My name is Kelly Mastin from the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we introduce today's presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording along with the PowerPoint presentation slides will be available on the Bazelon website at www.bazelon.org and the NASHBID website at www.nasmhtd.org within three to five days. For participants only, audio is being streamed to your computer speakers with no need to connect by phone unless necessary, in which case the phone number is listed in the notes section on the screen. If you are having any technical difficulties during this webinar, please type your comment in the Q&A pod on the right side of your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenters in the Q&A pod, and, if, and at the end of the presentation, we will ask as many questions as we can. The PowerPoint slides are available at the top of your screen where it says PowerPoint slides. Please click on Upload File to download the, the PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> we will have a short evaluation at the end of the webinar for you to give us feedback. We ask that you take a few moments to complete that for us. Please know that we do not offer CEU credits for our webinars, but will send you a letter of attendance upon request. My email address will be available at the top of the screen during the evaluation. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today, and again, thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Bethany Lilly from Bazelon, who will introduce today's presenters. Bethany? Thanks so much, Kelly, and also thanks to SAMHSA for allowing us the opportunity to share all this information with you. Um, we have a great set of presenters today, and I'm, you can see on the screen um, slides depicting their bios here and here, um, and so I'll keep it nice and short. Um, Mark is the managing attorney of the Bazelon Center and has a very long history working for people with disabilities and specifically with people with mental illness, and so we're very excited to get his perspective. And we're also joined by Elizabeth Jones, who has been um, an expert consultant or court monitor in multiple Olmstead cases, including a couple of ours, and who has um, tons of experience um, working in mental health systems and reforming them. And so I'll just turn it over to Mark and Elizabeth, and I'm really excited for the presentation. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be monitoring that, so um, we'll keep an eye on the question box down in the corner of your screen. Mark? Okay, thanks, Bethany. Um, uh, we're going to talk today about criminal justice and the ADA and people with mental illness. Um, we're going to talk in particular about how the principles of the ADA and especially its integration mandate under the uh, 1999 Olmstead decision can and should play a part in jail diversion efforts. And we're also going to talk about the what the application of these principles means on a practical level in terms of uh, services for people uh, with mental illness uh, to avoid involvement with the criminal justice system. Um, on the screen now, we have uh, basically the outline of what we're going to do. I'm going to provide some context, talk a little bit about uh, what the problem is and um, a little bit about how it came to be. Uh, 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 we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the institutionalization and issues related to that leading up to the passage of the ADA in Olmstead. Uh, so a little bit of the background there. Then we'll talk about um, using Olmstead to reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in jails, uh, what challenges cities and counties may face in that regard. Uh, to talk a little bit about some uh, questions that uh, we think that uh, uh, cities and counties should be thinking about if they're not doing so already about uh, complying uh, with the ADA and Olmstead and also uh, um, not just as a legal matter but because of the positive outcomes that come from a, a more robust community service system um, in trying to make sure that people are thinking about these questions, not just from a legal perspective, but from a policy and even financial perspective. And then 
Elizabeth is going to talk in some detail about practical considerations around service delivery systems and some issues to be thinking about there. So um, uh, there will be questions um, uh, at the end as well, but if you have questions, you can use the, the fancy technology we're using to, um, uh, to enter them, and if it, if it fits into the flow and I think will help advance the discussion, we'll take them as we go along. If not, we'll try to address as many questions as possible um, at the end. So with that, we'll get started. Um, so in terms of the problem today, I think um, we can say somewhat without controversy uh, what some of the issues are that we're facing in terms of people with mental illness in jails. Uh, most obviously, people with mental illness are overrepresented in jails. Um, uh, we know that they're frequently arrested for behaviors related to their disabilities, including administrative offenses, such as the uh, failure to appear or failure to respond to summonses or citations, um, other types of quality of life offenses that happen to people who may be mentally ill and poor, whether it's vagrancy, public urination, all sorts of other types of things. Generally, for the most part, as we know, uh, you know not, not acts of dangerousness or violence, but in fact more related to quality of life offenses. Uh, an alarming number of people with mental illness enter the criminal justice system uh, for very minor offenses. Um, so um, we also know as part of the problem that um, once in jail, people with mental illness fare poorly. They are uh, obviously jail is a difficult place to be for anyone. Um, and particularly so if you have serious mental illness, uh, you have inadequate access to treatment in many situations when you're in jail. Uh, often the imposition of discipline for breaking of rules that you might not be able to follow or uh, for whatever reason. Uh, and rather than the provision of reasonable accommodations for, for disability, uh, you frequently see the imposition of discipline which just exacerbates an already bad situation. Um, this all leads to, um, you know, uh, these problems feed on themselves and you end up in a situation where people can be uh, incarcerated for longer than people would be if they didn't have mental illness. That's true if you're charged and just waiting in jail. And it's also true once you're convicted and end up in prison. So people with mental illness will be incarcerated longer than people without mental illness. And then um, it's hardly surprising also to know that people with mental illness are more costly to have in jail, in part because of the need for treatment, special programs, medication, et cetera. And so uh, we give one example here uh, and, uh, based on a report that Bazelon and the ACLU of Southern California did a few years ago uh, using the example of Los Angeles County where the average cost of jailing an individual with serious mental illness was almost $50,000 a year. The cost of providing um, some common community-based services was less than half that. And so that's just an example from one place about the, um, how much more costly it is to be in jail and the potential um, savings that can happen and then the amount of money that can be applied to community services uh, if you have fewer people with mental illness in jail. So um, as those of you on the webinar know, cities and counties are using a number of different practices to address this issue. This is a, an issue that has gotten a lot of prominence in the last few years. Um, our view and one of the reasons why we're very happy to be doing the webinar is that and we believe that the knowledge and implementation of the requirements of the ADA is crucial for those who manage and work in correctional and criminal justice programs and for those who deliver mental health um, services. And the issues and the and decisions that have to be made by those systems to the extent that they can be analyzed through and looked at through the lens of the ADA and the, Olm and Olm the Olmstead decision, I think will uh, provide um, not just a better way to affirmatively comply with the law, as we all must do, but also you have an alignment of, of legal um, compliance, uh, positive policy outcomes, people do better, and then of course um, there's also um, significant financial uh, savings to possibly uh, be had and to be used in a more positive way that is on mental health services. So we hear a lot about diversion now and you know, the bottom line really is you really can't effectively address the issue of reducing the number of people with mental illness in jail without developing an appropriate array of community services. You, you have to have services and, and housing and essentially 
places to divert people to, and if that, was, if that is done properly, that makes it less likely that people with mental illness will be involved with the criminal justice system. So um, briefly, a little bit more background. As I think most of you know, is the, the institutionalization movement, which went through the 60s and the 70s, led to people with mental illness not being hospitalized and people who were hospitalized being released. Um, that uh, there are a lot of uh, legal advances that occurred during that time uh, to make sure that the civil rights of people with mental illness were protected. Um, and then that movement peaks in the 80s, and the end result is uh, more people are discharged from the hospital into community services, but also many people never go into the hospital to begin with and instead have to rely on community services um, from the beginning. And so you end up in a situation where people now might say, and you hear commonly, you know, about the institutionalization being the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the blame for uh, the reason why so many people with mental illness are incarcerated. We're also hearing a lot about the use of hospitals. It's, again, we're hearing echoes of this discussion in the most recent um, uh, uh, news related to the, the school shooting in Florida and what role mental illness plays in gun violence. You have the president and others uh, talking about uh, using um, uh, m mental health hospitals again and long-term psychiatric facilities. So we're hearing about a lot of these issues again, and it never really goes away. And then after an incident of this type, uh, it gets resurrected. And it's been particularly true in this most recent incident in Florida. And so you often hear people talk about um, the institutionalization being to the blame for people uh, with mental illness being incarcerated to the degree that they are. But um, I think that doesn't tell the whole story, as we have a little bit on our slide here. There are a lot of reasons why um, people with uh, mental illness have been incarcerated. Um, there's the um, uh, failure to, you know, to provide community services in, in the same degree as we had institutionalization. So when people came out of hospitals, they were not provided the necessary services they need. We're still fighting that battle today, obviously. There's generally a collective failure on all levels of government to ensure appropriate funding on, on mental health. Um, there's uh, been rising homelessness as a result of reductions in spending on rental subsidies. Um, less so today, but in recent decades, an increase in law and order and around the policy, uh, 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 policies and the war on drugs. Uh, more people were being arrested and sent to jail. So these all contribute to this issue of having people with mental illness um, in prison. And so that um, people say, well, why not rely more on psychiatric hospitals instead of jails? Obviously, we've tried that once. It didn't work out as well as people thought at the time. Uh, it would mark a return to where people were segregated from society. We've moved away from that and made a judgment as a society not to do that. It forces a choice between jails and hospitals, which are really two types of institutionalizations that don't get at what people really need, and which is not, as we know, the large, large majority of people with mental illness don't need hospital care, but rather need housing, community mental health services, and others. Um, and from our perspective, and from the perspective of many others, we think there are better tools, including applying the ADA and Olmstead across the correction and mental health system, having those systems work together uh, to ensure that there's an appropriate amount of services to be had for people. Um, so very quickly what the ADA does, I think most people probably know in some detail, some more than others. Um, the, um, generally it's an anti-discrimination uh, statute, as you know, it covers employment, housing, public accommodations, education, transportation. We're talking in particular about Title II of the ADA. And um, it prohibits discrimination by public entities. And public entities um, can be everything from, in this situation, talking about uh, everything that's involved in the public mental health um, uh, system and also in the correction system. So both the ADA, more, in terms of general um, uh, um, anti-discrimination, everything from making sure places are physically accessible to how services are provided. And so it really does cut across all of the various services that you would end up dealing with if you were somebody who was touching the public mental health system or the correction system. So um, that would be jails, police departments, probation and parole agencies, the court system, 
district attorney's offices, public defenders, everyone involved in the criminal justice system has some obligation under the ADA. They vary depending on what services are provided and what people do. Uh, you also have, in terms of the elements of the mental health system, psychiatric hospitals, inpatient facilities or outpatient facilities, community mental health programs, and then even the system by which we pay for a lot of these services, the Medicaid program, has to be done, done in a non-discriminatory way. So there's a lot of interaction between the ADA and, um, the, the, and the Medicaid program. Uh, and so all this together shows that when you're basically talking about dealing with folks with mental illness who touch the criminal justice system, the ADA uh, plays, a, plays, a, plays, a, plays a huge role in that. Um, so um, the integration mandate, this is what the Olmstead case uh, affirmed, uh, basically requires that all of these services, court services, uh, mental health services, jail services, have to be done so that people are not discriminated against, meaning they have to be uh, provided services in integrated settings. Um, integrated settings means that to the maximum extent possible, people with mental illness would interact and live in the same community as people without disabilities, provided the opportunity to live and work and receive services where people without disabilities also receive services. So, as I said earlier, this is an affirmative obligation that is required, but it also, as we'll talk about, has following this obligation leads to policy and financial um, uh, uh, success as well. Um, and so as you look at your systems, it helps to think about is the mental health and criminal justice system where you work, uh, are, you, um, you know, are you reaching these goals in terms of maximizing the integration of people with mental illness uh, to the maximum extent uh, appropriate. Just a little bit more on the integration mandate, living in one's own apartment with supported housing, supported services, and the employment context, maybe having a job coach. Uh, but the basic bottom line principle of all this is that needless institutionalization of people with mental illness is illegal discrimination, whether that be in a jail or a hospital or some other um, facility. Um, so. And then a little bit, again, briefly, the um, Olmstead decision. I think it's just important to mention, too, the reasoning in the decision. We know what the court held and affirmed that unjustified institutional isolation is a form of discrimination. But it's important to note the reasoning which we have here, which is that needless institutionalization perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that people are incapable or unworthy or unworthy of participating in community life and it severely curtailed everyday life activities, including family, work, education, and social contact. So it's, I think, indisputed now that the, uh, the, based on really now decades of experience, that you know, people do better in virtually every way one can measure if they are integrated to the maximum extent appropriate. That's what the people with mental illness who need services want, uh, and that's uh, what the obligation is to provide um, unless there's some very important reason why that can't be the case. So post-Olmstead, you see a series of reforms. You have uh, Olmstead plans um, that states and also some cities and counties uh, do that, uh, that were designed to identify people to be served, what services they might need, essentially try and put in place what it will take to provide integrated services for people with all sorts of disabilities, not just mental illness. There's been very mixed success with Olmstead plans. Not everybody does them. When they do them, they don't always uh, aren't always implemented properly. But basically, that you see more and more of them, and that I think continue to be the case. Um, we mentioned here talking a little bit about some settlements of litigation that led to very positive outcomes. And we're going to be talking about both of these situations, both the, when the United States Department of Justice. Uh, brought claims against the state of Georgia and the state of Delaware. And as part of those settlements, people came together and created, I think, very um, progressive settlements that focused on the people with mental illness, identified the services and supports that needed to be made. I think, uh, as we'll talk about, both of these states um, made changes, you know, not just in terms of uh, the mental health system itself, but also talked about housing, Medicaid, how you train law enforcement officers. And as we'll talk about, um, this has led to uh, dramatically reduced reliance on institutional facilities and better integration of people with mental illness into the community. So 
as we'll talk about, the goal moving forward continues to be to take what we've learned through these legal settlements and other work that's been done over the last few years and convince mental health and criminal justice systems to apply these lessons so that you know, litigation or settlements are not really the driving uh, motivation. So you know, we want people to do it not only because it, the law requires it, but also because it's the best approach, as I've mentioned now a couple of times, both from a legal but also a policy and a financial um, uh, perspective. And it leads to people with mental illness to get effective services that have now been proven to keep them out of um, the criminal justice system or to minimize contact to the, to the to the extent possible. And so just to give one example, again, we'll talk about this in a little more detail later. In Delaware, by the end of their five-year settlement, which ended in the latter part of 2016, um, the number of beds went down dramatically, 42%, maximizing of Medicaid spending, um, using outpatient services doubled. And so there's a lot of information, a lot more detailed information about this on the at the, at the site that I've mentioned there. Um, on the ADA.gov site where they talk a good bit about the uh, various reports that were submitted in that case. And so there's a lot to be learned from, from that experience. Um, other positive um, outcomes you see, again, for housing up, people receiving employment services up dramatically. People receiving um, uh, employment went up by 400%. So, you know, this, this is not, I think, a big secret that, you know, when you have stable housing, you can get access to decent employment and access to necessary services, you're far more, less likely to offend and enter the criminal justice system. And so, um, obviously, as we've talked about, people in jail, who, you know, people, most people with mental illness who are in jail lack access to the right kind of community mental health services. So that's the succinct way of stating the problem. And if we can use these Olmstead services and implement the ADA, we think we can make a significant dent in that problem as we, as we, move, as we move forward. So some critical um, facts that I think people have to sort of always be thinking about as they move through this process. Um, you know, under Olmstead and the ADA, the avoidable incarceration and jail of people with mental illness is a form of unjustified um, uh, institutionalization. So it doesn't, also it doesn't just apply and people shouldn't just be thinking about, you know, compliance with the ADA and trying to, to deal with these issues just in terms of psychiatric hospitals. If people are necessarily in jail because of the absence of appropriate community services, that's an issue that needs to be addressed and there's an affirmative obligation to do so under the ADA and on Olmstead. Um, Jails have become, they shouldn't be, but they have become de facto a part of the mental health system. And so one of the things that we'll be talking, have, are talking about and we'll continue to talk about for the remainder of this discussion is how a criminal justice system and mental health systems have to work together, really collaborate uh, regarding um, how to deal with this problem. Court systems as well, everything in the criminal justice system, police, prosecutors, the courts, all of that. Um, Important to note, as we've said before, that people are not who go to jail or with mental illness are not usually public safety risks. You have the funding and that diverting people is feasible and cost effective. So this is sort of, we know this to be true and now how we translate these things that we know are true and use the overlay of Olmstead and the ADA to get us to where we need to be. So um, that's obviously not always a particularly easy thing to do. Um, we know there are a lot of different types of challenges for this. One is, as I mentioned, ins ensuring the collaboration between the multiple players in the mental health and criminal justice systems. Um, that's proven to be a big challenge, though um, particularly in the examples we're using in Delaware and Georgia, there's been dramatic um, um, uh, uh, success, and that's led to very important outcomes, as we'll talk about. Um, overcoming barriers to diverting individuals to the criminal justice system. So. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this shortly, but basically services have to be available at all different points where people can be diverted, not just sort of at the, uh, I'm not going to get arrested part. So there are very various points where people touch the criminal justice system and services have to be available so you can divert people out of the criminal justice system at a variety of points in the process. So perhaps um, the person doesn't get arrested, but if a person is arrested, perhaps they can be um, diverted to either a crisis uh, a program 
or even family can come and take them before they're actually booked or processed. If it turns out that they are booked and placed in jail, there's a way of identifying them and getting them out of that situation as quickly as possible. And so this continues going even into the courts. If a person is still not diverted and is, um, as, we'll, as we'll talk about, has fits into the category of people that you want to divert, then um, that person can get diverted as late as you know, when they're in the court system and facing the criminal charges. So the barriers to diverting individuals in the criminal justice system, you know, it's easy to say, but it's obviously a very complicated thing to figure out what services you'll need at all of these various points in what, who gets them, in what amounts. Um, so this is not an easy question, uh, question to answer, but it's one that needs to be thought about. And then it really another challenge is understanding what savings can be anticipated, the business case for diversion. Is there, is there a business case for diversion? We believe there is in most situations, but you need to figure out how much um, the current way of doing business is costing your program, your city, your county, your mental health system, your, your jail system. How much is the current way of doing business actually costing? There's a temptation and a practice generally where people are just looking maybe at what mental health services cost. And they're not thinking about the full cost in, in, in terms of all of these systems when people are unnecessarily moving through the system in terms of jail costs, treatment costs in jail, um, police costs, costs for a district attorney's office and public defenders if they're spending a lot of time prosecuting and defending cases that never have to get to a courtroom. What is, what is the cost of that? So it's really not just a matter of what mental health services might cost, but it's actually how much across the whole system. And once you have a better sense of what things cost across all of the systems, then you can figure out the business case because you can see where the savings are and how that money can then be moved to uh, used in a more positive way, which is rather than prosecuting people uh, to provide them with the services they need but aren't, but aren't getting. Um, so we also have some compliance. We've come up with some questions that we recommend that people think about if they're not doing this already. Um, just a way of uh, promoting um, analysis of these issues. Um, so um, one is what I just mentioned, are all the elements of the justice system, police, corrections, prosecutors, et cetera, they working collaboratively and with the mental health system to avoid the needless incarceration. They can't be operating at not just cross purposes, but they need to be talking to each other about how to do that. Um, a really important one is the second one. You know, what's the typical profile of a person with mental illnesses whose incarceration could and should be avoided? Um, it's, it's really important that uh, people undertaking this process identify you know, the target population. Who's going to be diverted? Who's going to be moved into services? Um, is it going to be based on, um, you know, some places I know have done it in, they try to focus on people who come into the system the most. So if you've had, you know, three or more arrests in the last year, you know, you're a primary, uh, you're a primary target. Um, it may be based on the number of commitments you might have or your risk of homelessness. If you are currently homeless or you're at risk of homeless because you don't have stable housing. There are many different ways to do it, but it's really important that you figure out who this group is, where they are, and, and, and start with that. Um, and then obviously the mechanisms that are needed to uh, accomplish the diversion. So after the who, you need to look at what specific steps need to be taken, um, what infrastructure exists and what needs, you know, what does your current system look like? We'll also talk a little bit about this um, in Elizabeth section. What do your current system look like and what it needs to look like? But it's important to sort of start thinking about the mechanisms and um, to figure out where the deficits are and start planning to fix those deficits. Um, part of that is in making sure that they, the jurisdiction has or is developing the full array of mental health services that are available. Uh, many uh, uh, places have some but not all, or they have all but not in the right amounts. And so these are um, you know, proven uh, successful uh, for many people to reduce their involvement with the criminal justice system. So it's important to be looking at what your jurisdiction has and what it needs. Um, that obviously implicates a uh, provider network, and so you need to think about how that network needs to be created or grow to ensure appropriate community-based alternatives. Um, another question that comes up is uh, about community 
providers permitted to refuse services to individuals because they've been arrested or incarcerated? The answer should be no, but are, um, you need to be looking for whether it's this problem or others in the system that can be addressed through policy changes or through better enforcement of existing policies to make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to who needs to be served and how they need to be served. Um, and then a really major one, obviously, is whether uh, your jurisdiction has identified all possible sources of funding for housing and other services, including maximizing uh, Medicaid funding. Obviously, um, it's important to look at um, uh, uh, the financial piece, and Medicaid is, as you know, the subject of a lot of debate and discussion at this point. Uh, but um, as, as of now, at least, it pays for a large, large number of percentage of, of services for uh, people with uh, mental illness. And uh, you know, we work uh, a lot here at the Bazelon Center to try and make that um, even more, um, fighting against you know, repeal of the Medicaid expansion and uh, um, trying to make sure that the Medicaid services continue uh, uh, to pay for as much as is possible. So again, it's important to look at this issue uh, through the lens of the ADA and Olmstead to make sure that uh, the, the legal and uh, policy and financial uh, uh, benefits and goals are in alignment. And we think that that, that, it, that can be the case when, as I say, you look at this through the, um, uh, uh, the lens of ADA and Olmstead to make sure that your jurisdiction is coming into compliance if they're not in compliance, but also thinking about it in terms of how best to expand community services and the ADA and Olmstead provides the mechanism for, for doing that. So I think with that, I will pass it on to Elizabeth. And we will um, take 10 seconds and switch seats so she is closer to the phone. But um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be part of this webinar. As uh, Mark said a few minutes ago, a serious problem is that people with mental illnesses who are jailed lack access to the right kind of community mental health services. So for my part of the presentation, I'm going to speak um, somewhat succinctly and briefly about the different components of a mental health system. And then Mark and I will talk further about the work that was done in Delaware as part of the settlement agreement between Delaware and the Justice Department to reform its system and to get the resources and the attention to where it needed to be, especially for people who were at risk of institutionalization. I know that many of you are very experienced in working with mental health uh, programs and or in reforming mental health systems. So I tried to organize my presentation uh, according to practical considerations for service delivery systems so that I could summarize the levels of effort that are needed at the individual level, the programmatic level, and the systemic level, and also to emphasize the critical importance of collaboration across programs and agencies. Each level of effort requires multidimensional advocacy, leadership within the system, contemporary knowledge about mental health and mental illness, but also about what works and what doesn't work, what mistakes can we avoid replicating in the future. Each level of effort requires sufficient resources for implementation, and they and it is required that there be evaluation, both internal and external strategies, to measure the quality of what's being done. And once the results of those evaluation strategies are analyzed, we come back to advocacy and the need to push further for reform and changes needed. I have spent uh, quite a bit of time in the last couple of months visiting jails. Uh, both rural and urban, ranging in size from 32 people incarcerated to well over 2,000, as a way to inquire about discharge practices for people with serious mental illness. And I'm going to try to use uh, a couple of examples of my findings as I go through my presentation. <clears throat> 
I want to start by just acknowledging that the people who run the jails, uh, the sheriffs, the wardens, are they just seem to be overwhelmingly interested in having this support. Someone who goes into a jail with active mental illness is really a difficult person for a jail to work with. And it often requires placing the person in a holding cell where they can be observed 24 hours a day. It may require extra uh, attention in terms of staffing. And the, the inability sometimes of people who work in the jail to really uh, develop a relationship with the mentally ill person or to figure out the best way to work with them while they're in the confinement of a jail uh, makes them very eager for help and for any kind of assistance that helps resolve some of the problems that that creates. So individual effort is where I'll begin and actually that is where everything all begins and must end. Every person with serious mental illness requiring support and services has a wide range of needs, abilities, and interests. And part of our job as people who work in this field is to try to really understand and appreciate what those varying needs, abilities, and interests are so that our program interventions can be designed to uh, address each individual person rather than people as a group or as a, a, con a congregation of needs. Two factors seen in many people with serious mental illness who haven't been given the supports and services they need are the fact that they are ris at risk of being homeless or entering the criminal justice system. And because of that, there may be extraordinary levels of trauma in their lives and great difficulty establishing and maintaining trusting relationships. For those of you who work in, in interventions focused in on trauma, you know that trauma can come from many different um, causes, child abuse, damaged or severed family relationships, poverty, and it can also come from experiences in institutional settings. One of the men that I met recently on my jail visits uh, talked with me about the fact that since being in jail, he had seen two cellmates uh, die. One committed suicide and one was murdered by other people uh, incarcerated in the jail. The fact that he had serious mental illness to start with when he went into jail uh, was compounded by the fact that he went through extraordinary trauma while incarcerated. And when I asked him if he received any help at all for the trauma that he had gone through, he said that in jail, the practice, the response, the practice is to have a lockdown, not to offer support. So this man, when he was discharged from the jail, when he was released, had to think about where to go and how to build in supports for himself so that his trauma could be addressed so that he could sleep at night and stop having nightmares, as well as so that other parts of his life could be organized. The trauma may be noted in case files, but it doesn't always get the level of focus and attention that's necessary. A second major factor that may influence uh, what's happening to someone with serious mental illness who's homeless who, or who has been incarcerated is that trusting relationships that are necessary at all levels are not present. Relationships, as you know, become fractured due to trauma, lack of continuity and longe longevity in residential and other supports behavior or symptoms connected to the psychiatric illness, lives disrupted by staff turnover, or by changes in providers responsible for support. So two basic issues then that need to be addressed when thinking about the services offered and the services that may need to be reformed are the experiences that someone has had, the traumatic experiences, and the fact that it may be difficult for them to establish trusting relationships given what they have gone through in their life. On the programmatic level, 
we know that mental health systems must have in place the array of evidence-based practices proven to be effective in order to provide comprehensive community-based support. And not only do these programmatic efforts need to be in place as individual entities, they need to be connected in ways that are reasonable and that contribute to the continuity of support for the person. And I think this list is very familiar to everyone. For example, there needs to be a sort of community treatment or ACT teams, scattered site supported housing, supported employment, peer support, intensive case management, and crisis services in all of the array that's required, mobile crisis teams, crisis apartments, for example, and respite support. So I'll briefly highlight key points about each of these uh, programmatic components. And then uh, if there are any questions, of course, at the end, we, can, um, we would be very glad to respond further. We know that ACT teams are a very successful, very effective, now frequently studied evidence-based practice. And we know that there are fidelity measures, the DACs or the TMACs, that exist to determine how well services are using ACT services, how well systems are using ACT services. I have um, been informed through the people that I work with that the TMAC uh, measures actually focus more on recovery of, from mental illness, and that's not as present with the DAX fidelity scale. One of the issues that I've been trying to be focused on and that I would bring to your attention are the scores that not only relate to the organization of the ACT team, but the subscores that measure intensity of supports, for example. How often is the person seen? How much interaction do they have with a um, ACT team member? There may be ACT teams that are very well organized and very well structured in terms of the caseload size and the number of professionals on the team. But they may, in fact, struggle with seeing people uh, frequently enough or offering the level of intensity that a person requires at any particular point in time. It's really important, and one of the issues we'll identify with the Delaware case is how um, systems to manage data can be fragmented and not very complete. So if there is a very reliable data system to look at what happens to people who are enrolled in ACT, we can use that data to identify successes as well as to identify the problems that may need to be fixed. As uh, you may very well know, ACT teams include a psychiatrist, a nurse, employment specialist, case workers, and a peer specialist. Um, they are available to the person who's enrolled with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And depending on the person, daily contact may occur as needed, whether the person's going through an adjustment period or whether the person has experienced a particular crisis at that point in time. And we know that ACT teams will be effective when the fidelity standards are met. There, it is clear, has been clearly documented that there has been reduction in hospitalization and incarceration rates. And the data maintained by the ACT team should clearly point to this. Now, some issues that might be examined further with the use of ACT teams include how to ensure that jail personnel know how to access ACT when they're thinking about releasing someone from jail. How are ACT teams funded to begin their contact while a person is in jail waiting to be released? and how do ACT teams learn that their client is in jail in the first place. One of the challenging examples I saw on my jail visits involved a woman who was repeatedly in and out of jail because she refused to obey a protective order that uh, prohibited her from being at her family home. She had a very serious mental illness and she did not understand why her family did not want her back at their house. 
And as a result, every time she was released from jail, she would go back to their uh, family home. They would call the police. She'd be brought before the court again, and she would be brought to jail. She was in a revolving door cycle of incarceration. It was interesting that in this jail, it was fairly small in a rural town in the mountains, the sheriff had very limited information about how to access mental health services, and he was at a loss, not because he didn't want help. He desperately wanted help. He was at a loss as to how to get that help. So after going with him to meet the woman and sitting and speaking with her and realizing that when she was able to think about this clearly, she would... Um, she would be glad to have help. She would be responsive to help. A connection was made to an ACT team to come and begin to work with her. However, even though she was uh, cooperative and interested in having support when first spoken with, when the ACT team came, she was delusional and she was very resistant to anyone um, being involved with her. This made the situation more complicated because when she became very withdrawn, she refused to eat or she would throw her tray of food against the wall, which would um, make the jail personnel really very upset. So with, with her as an example, it showed to me how necessary it is that connections be um, established over time, if possible. This woman was known to the system. She was, as I said, in and out of the jail repeatedly. And that there be multiple ways for uh, the ACT team to begin to develop a relationship with her. Obviously, their ability to do that was constrained by the fact she was in a holding cell. It was not possible to say, oh, why don't we go out and have a cup of coffee and talk for a little bit uh, before they offered her any services, they had to deal with a very difficult situation. And at this point in time, uh, she is still in jail, and they are still trying to reach out to her. The next programmatic effort to sketch out um, today is supported housing, another resource that we know is critically important in stabilization and the reduction of contact with the criminal justice system. And we've listed on the uh, slide a number of resources, including the seminal work done by Sam Zambaris about the Housing First model. One of the issues that's come up that I just want to flag here, and it relates back to the woman I just spoke about in jail, is that sometimes people will refuse to have services. And a key component of the Housing First model is that you don't really argue that. You give them a place to live, and then hopefully over time, the person will become more trusting and will be more responsive to the services uh, that they require or that they would benefit from. So one of the issues that I've been facing recently and that I've have had to think a lot about is what do you do when a significant number of people in the system say that they certainly want the housing and the housing voucher to provide that, but they don't want to have services. How does the service system really remain responsible as well as respectful of that person's wishes? And one of the thoughts that um, I've been talking with some of my colleagues about is that it's important, again, thinking about trusting relationships, not to lose contact with the person. So at the very least, even if the person uh, does not wish to be connected to a service provider, which is their right, there could be a monthly so-called health and safety check where somebody goes to the apartment just to see how the person is doing and how well the apartment is being maintained. Obviously, if people don't take care of their apartments, there are repercussions for other people who might want to move into that apartment complex and for the relationship with the landlord. So there's a balance here that has to be explored. 
And to just um, sort of abdicate responsibility for the person and not do anything to make sure that they are doing well and that they have any support that they might need, even if they're not acknowledging it, seems to be a critical issue for discussion and some kind of balanced approach. Uh, the components of supported housing that you find embodied in many of the settlement agreements that deal with housing with supports are that they are, a scatter, they are scattered sites that you don't have all the apartments in one building. There's a limit to how many people uh, with a mental disability are being placed together so that you avoid a congregate setting or a de facto institution type setting for people and that they be in an integrated location so that people, often people who lack transportation and resources to move around through um, buses or taxis or Ubers or whatever, um, you know, they have to have a way to get to resources and they should be in valued areas with people that they can perhaps begin to develop friendships and relationships with. People who come out of jails or from the correctional systems often are difficult to place in apartment settings because landlords do not want tenants who have a history of incarceration. And here, again, as in many parts of the service system, what is critically important to solve that issue is to have a good relationship between the service provider who is helping to find the apartment and the landlord. Just as when you try to find someone a job, you can't go through all of the standard apply through the newspaper type of ads. You need to have relationships between the employment specialist and the employer. In the same way with landlords, especially for people who are coming out of jails or prisons, there needs to be a connection established. The person who is uh, supported under supported housing and this model is to have tenancy rights. They sign the lease. They are responsible for the lease. They should have a choice as to where they live, whether and who they have as a housemate. And they should have the supports they need to maintain their housing and to navigate available community resources. One critically important resource that's always you know, undervalued, I think, and not maybe paid as much attention to as should be is the use of natural support. Are there neighbors? Are there people in local community churches, uh, agencies, or supports clubs where the person goes who could help uh, provide the support that the person needs? The development of the natural supports is very important because physical integration is not the same as social integration. Someone can live in an apartment complex and they can still be socially isolated because they lack social networks, they experience loneliness, and they have difficulty making new friends, especially after the uh, life experiences we talked about earlier of trauma and disrupted support. Supported employment is another programmatic effort where research has clearly shown the benefit in, re in the recovery process. The work done by Robert Drake and his colleagues at Dartmouth, as well as the research conducted by Judith Cook at the University of Chicago, shows the extraordinary value of employment in helping people recover from serious mental illness. There are fidelity measures used to um, look at the effectiveness of supported employment. And we, we know that we may need to think about the point at which employment is considered in the recovery process. When someone leaves jail or leaves another institutional setting, a state hospital, for example, we typically focus in on where they're going to live. That's a very logical first consideration. However, employment doesn't often rise to that priority level. 
often people will say, well, we'll get the person settled and then we'll look at where they're going to work or what their interest is in employment. But in reality, that's not how life usually evolves. Most of us work near where we live or we live near where we work. Where we live and where we work go together for us most of the time. And so one of the strategies that might be reconsidered is being more thoughtful about when work becomes considered as part of the recovery plan for the person. One of the individuals that another man that I met, the man who actually had um, seen both of his uh, cellmates die, when he was released from jail, he found work on his own. He actually slept on the streets because he was discharged without housing and was not connected to a mental health agency, but he found his own job as a short order cook. And when the apartment was located for him, when he eventually was connected to a provider agency, there was no apartment close to his job location. The job was incredibly important to him. It was more important than where he lived. And so he accepted an apartment that was further away. But unfortunately, the initial subsidy he was given for transportation, for bus money, uh, ran out. And the agency didn't replenish that money. So this man gets up at 3.30 in the morning to walk 45 minutes to his job, which starts at 5 o'clock in the morning, because he doesn't want to risk losing his job. If there was any lesson, I mean, there are multiple lessons in that example, but one clear lesson is the value of work for that person and how he's prioritized it. OK, just uh, two more brief parts of the uh, programmatic effort. Peer support services. Again, we have a variety of evidence-based uh, research and documentation to support the value of peer support services, including um, manuals, the kit produced by SAMHSA. Um, we know from lessons that have been learned through experiences and in various states, the value of peer support. Uh, Georgia was one of the first states to really credential and certify peers and took a lead in developing many health and wellness centers, peer support centers, for people to go to. Peer specialists have a remarkable ability to connect with people and to use their lived experiences to help people move along in the recovery process. Because of their life experiences, they're able to establish trusting relationships. They know when to engage the person and when to leave them alone. One of the more challenging issues I've had to work with in my own work has been how professional staff often find it very difficult to accept peers as equal in the recovery process. Uh, the first peer support center that I worked with was Amistad in Portland, or, uh, in Portland, Maine. And that program had tried to help um, become involved with people with serious mental illness in emergency rooms. And the emergency room physicians and nurses were extremely hesitant about that happening. But once the peer specialists began to work in the ER and begin to interact with people who had been brought in in crisis, they quickly realized their value. They were able to help stabilize people in the emergency room so that further hospitalization was not needed and the person could return home with supports around them. Crisis services is also a very frequently studied evidence-based practice so shown to be successful in diverting people with serious mental illness away from hospitalization, contact with the criminal justice system, and incarceration. The system needs to have an array of crisis services that will assist people at different levels of need, and some of those Services include a crisis hotline, 
or a warm line, as it's called, where a person who's not yet in crisis but who's feeling uh, unsettled or anxious or the need to talk with someone will have a place to call. Mobile crisis teams, crisis centers, um, places where people can walk in and get help if they are in crisis, crisis apartments, and targeted case management teams. When we speak about the Delaware um, work that was done to reform the system, we'll talk about the living room model and how peer support services were used as part of crisis intervention. Um, this, when we're thinking, too, about the police and the sheriffs who are involved with people who need to have um, someone around them because of the crisis situation, we can realize how much concern there is on the um, part of the police and the sheriffs because of the time that this takes to transport someone or because they may need to bring in a deputy to help with the situation and that reduces one staff person. In rural areas, there may only be two deputies on duty at a time. So if you take one person away to transport someone, then the one other person is left by themselves. So again, we'll touch on this briefly with the Delaware. In terms of the system, the point that Mark made at the beginning is the one that I'd like to reinforce here. There has to be connections. There has to be knowledge. There has to be working relationships between mental health and disability services and all the different components of the criminal justice system. The police, the courts, the district attorneys, the public defenders, and the people that are responsible for jails and the correctional services themselves. So let me just make two points here. In terms of the public defenders, I met with them uh, last week, actually, in a metropolitan area, and was very concerned to hear them talk about the fact that people with serious mental illness, they were very, um, they were having a great deal of difficulty in this area connecting people to services. And so people were being um, picked up for misdemeanor crimes, kind of nuisance crimes like trespassing or loitering or urinating in public. And because people couldn't pay, because they had no resources, couldn't pay the bail money in order to avoid jail time, they were being incarcerated. Again, if there had been some mental health supports that could have stepped in and helped divert the person, not only would the public defender service be very happy and willing to work with the agency to have that happen, but it would have avoided the jail cycle for many of the people they um, represented. In in jails, because of the need to have nursing and medical and health care provided in jails and, and in prisons, correctional companies are often hired to provide those health-related services. They treat the person with mental illness in the jail, but they do not do discharge planning. So when the time comes for someone to be released, Unless there's an agency involved, like an ACT team, a community support team, or some other person uh, or agency support, people walk out of the door and they are left to fend for themselves. Another concern that came up last week again in one of my jail visits is that correctional companies don't often know the, the um, they don't really know the details about what's available in a community support system that's well put together and very responsive. And they may not uh, know that there are alternatives to such things as involuntary medic medication, forced medication. A young man that I met in a holding cell uh, was very willing to have assistance. Uh, he was open to having somebody come in and talk with him about the help that he needed, but he had not been connected to a resource like that by the correctional system personnel, and they were, because he refused medication, uh, he was very calm and 
very reasonable when I spoke with him, but he refused medication. And the correctional system personnel wanted him to take the medication before he was released. And they were considering uh, involuntarily medicating him, going to court and getting uh, permission to involuntarily medicate him. I think a situation like that could have been avoided if there had been an alternative resource offered to him. It goes without saying that the systemic level also includes advocacy organizations and other stakeholders, and that it's crucial for them to be involved in the development of planning and other resources and partnerships at the systemic level. There is a lot to be able to learn from the advocacy organizations and other stakeholders about what works and what doesn't work. And the more involvement they can have and the more information they can help provide to courts and the police about what is available and what resources can be brought to help them, um, the richer the system will be, the more effective the system will be. So let me move then in a few minutes with Mark to talk briefly about the change that took place in Delaware just very recently in moving from theory to necessary systemic change uh, as part of the revamping of the mental health system uh, as a result of the settlement of a lawsuit brought by the U.S. Department of Justice. The key elements and actions that were taken in Delaware involved first changing the culture. The culture, um, resources, training, knowledge was brought into the mental health system in Delaware through the court appointed monitor and the leadership of the Delaware system to make people understand that people with serious mental illness can and should live in the community with appropriate supports and services, and that there should be peer involvement in all aspects of the process. There was a, a renewed look at who was in the target population. When the case started, it was assumed that there were 3,000 people with serious mental illness that would require intervention through the mental health system. When all sources of possible, um, you know, that possibly had contact with serious, people with serious mental illness were included in the discussion. The number of people in the target population went from 3,000 to an, an estimated 13,000 people. Not only did they involve clients and community providers in identifying needed reforms, they established sustainable ways for these consumers and community providers to be included so that their involvement went from being a token effort to one that actually had uh, a demonstrable impact and, and that was paid attention to. And finally, they developed and applied clear criteria to measure progress and success. There were a lot of issues related to the lack of data systems, but as part of the settlement agreement work, they developed a dashboard that showed data about the reduction in inpatient days, the number of people diverted, the level of engagement in community services, and the actual level of contact with police and criminal justice system components. Okay, Mark is going to take over now and finish up. Okay, so um, just to follow up on a couple of points there, um, the, um, sorry, just have to switch seats get by the phone. So in terms of some of the, go back this one, just in back to the issue of the change in, in the culture and the presumption that people with serious mental illness can and should live in the community, one of the, uh, things that happened in Delaware that I think is interesting is that wasn't just a, a philosophy, but obviously that philosophy is important. But for example, uh, they realized that that had to be enforced in how services are actually provided. So for example, they had a policy or have a policy that the a proposed placement, other than an integrated housing setting, 
would have to be um, actually explained in detail and in writing. So clearly the, the default position is that people can be in integrated services and uh, that's where they will um, be headed. And if that isn't the case, then it has to be especially um, uh, um, defended and argued for, which I think is a good way to try and enforce the, uh, that presumption. So it has to be more than just talk, obviously. It has to be followed up with how things um, are done on a very practical level. Um, the same is true with peer involvement in the sense that it was done not just at all the different levels, uh, but in, uh, both in the hospital, uh, bridge peers as people are transitioning out, in the crisis services um, were hap uh, that was happening. We would mentioned earlier about uh, the living room model uh, in Delaware. They started with just one crisis program and it was uh, uh, hospital-based, which is not uncommon, they then uh, opened one that was uh, not hospital-based and people could come and go, so-called living room model where people could um, come in, um, talk to someone. Uh, that had a lot of success in terms of diversion from mental health, I'm sorry, from the criminal justice. And they realized that that was, had done so significantly well that they then ended up eliminating the program-based one and creating another living room model and becoming one of the first states, if not the first state, to do uh, to do non-program based across a statewide basis. So um, there are some interesting elements going on there. On just a very practical level, however, um, back to where we were, just on a very practical level, um, there's some key things that need to happen and that happened in Delaware, and I think it's worth pointing out, and has also they've been done other places in Delaware very, very recently. Um, to go ahead and figure out how you're going to overhaul your system and make the systemic change necessary, you have to do what they call mapping the system. So you have to figure out what program and agencies need to be involved, who the decision makers are. This is, you know, in, in, a, in any state, um, this is, can be a complicated thing given the way states are often divide up responsibilities. Who's responsible? The sources of funding. Um, a key element was um, figuring out just how to keep track of the data, where people were, where they should be, who's getting services, who's not. This proved particularly challenging and maybe challenging in places where people on this, uh, listening to this webinar may work, because when you get into the issue of government bureaucracies and different departments having different types of um, reporting or storage or sharing information, so a key element is figuring out exactly um, how you keep track of everyone who's in the system, who should be in the system, what services they're getting so um, people in, um, who, who might need it as part of the correction system can get access to it. People in the mental health system who might need something uh, can get access to it. Uh, all of those issues have to be dealt with. Um, then, of course, there is the coordination with law enforcement. Uh, this is um, obviously something that's extremely important if you are trying to reduce the amount of contact with the criminal justice system. Um, there has to be a systemic review and, uh, to uh, practices that may have um, unintended consequences. The example we show here and one that uh, the people in Delaware have talked about is um, uh, transporting people in crisis using trained and mental health folks rather than uh, police whenever possible. It's not always possible, but if it is doing that, it's a, uh, it's a simple change, but it's a, it sends a, lot, a, a completely different message uh, when, the, as is often the case in many places, the police are the primary form of transportation for people who might be in crisis from their homes to a hospital or, from, uh, um, uh, or to other types of programs. So having somebody um, uh, who does that who's not a police officer, when that's possible and consistent with safety, is an important change that can lead to um, important changes. And then, obviously, the very practical problem of funding and figuring out how to expand the array of services that can be funded through Medicaid and through waivers. Uh, this is something that um, is obviously very important, but it's also very complicated, and I'm sure people on this webinar know that. Um, figuring out what services can be paid. Uh, obviously, there has to be the, uh, the state share, so it's not like the services are free. The state has to put up its share of the money. But figuring out whether you are maximizing the services, are there ways to come up with more state dollars? Are there people who do this and consult with states to do this? Um, it's, it's a, it, you know, an example, with, and, and, and also then figuring out what services can be paid for that you haven't thought of before. So for example, in many states now, 
as Elizabeth mentioned, peers are being uh, certified, and with the proper background and certification, peer services can be uh, become a Medicaid service, and you're starting to see state plans be changed, you're starting to see waivers be amended to allow peers and also many others become uh, part of the um, part of the Medicaid program. And then um, aligning fiscal incentives with policy goals is also something that sometimes gets missed, but that's obviously extremely important. And that's because, obviously, if you are creating incentives to do something that you really don't want to have happen, that's going to cause havoc in your system. So the system needs to be examined to make sure that no one is, that, that the a fiscal incentive isn't skewing the decision-making point about where people end up and what services they get. That could be everything from uh, what services, how much services cost, and therefore create incentives for providers to provide some services over others. Um, in Delaware, using that as an example, uh, what happened was they had um, facility-based places that were um, able to bill higher rates uh, through insurance and others, and so, of course, they had an incentive to keep those beds filled. These were for short-term stays, and they were people didn't need to be in those hospitals in the sense that they could be out in the community through supported housing in other places. So they had to figure out a way to ensure that the funding system, whether uh, whether it was a state paying for it or Medicaid paying for it or insurance paying for it, uh, that there weren't ways to um, encourage the type of programs or the types of outcomes that we really didn't want, meaning that you wanted people in the supported housing and not in larger facility-based care. So um, that obviously is a, is a key practical point as well. Um, and there is, as I say, more information about this and you can contact us at the Bazelon Center. We can point you to somewhere, a lot of where the, some of this information is. And then finally, you have the coordination and partnerships necessary to ensure that systems work towards the common goal. Um, obviously, this issue, uh, we don't have to talk about it here. I think people are probably familiar with a crisis intervention and appropriate training for police. Uh, it's very important, obviously, for judges, prosecutors, court personnel, people who are not uh, historically part of the mental health system or even part of any system serving people with disabilities, but obviously as part of the criminal justice system, interact with people with serious mental illness a lot. And so uh, uh, providing the appropriate background so that judges, prosecutors, public defenders, and others who don't come at this with perhaps the same uh, point of view as we do in the sense that they, they, their view is, you know, they prosecute cases, they defend cases, they, they uh, uh, oversee cases in the case of a judge. So, but thinking about in terms of, again, diverting, getting people to think of this not as a problem, a criminal problem, but one of, uh, of, of providing appropriate services and therefore freeing up time, effort for people who need to be in the criminal justice system, unlike so many people with uh, mental health needs. And then, of course, then just best practices around mental health, other specialty courts. Of course, mental health and, other, and those types of courts are only as good as the services to which you can refer people, so this all comes together. You know, mental health courts themselves don't solve problems, but having a mental health court in coordination with an appropriate way of services to where people can go obviously makes makes a big deal. So just to wrap up, and then we'll have time for questions, I think. Yep. Um, um, little slide. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Whoops. Here we go. Um, so, um, just to wrap up, effective mental health programs, their responses, obviously they have the necessary resources. There's a lot of political will that has to be used to get to do what we're talking about, which is aligning systems so that they meet the requirements of the ADA and Olmstead. They meet the policy goals of providing people with the most integrated services possible, the most effective services possible. Uh, also the financial goals of using resources and maximizing resources wisely. So, we know what works to help people live meaningful lives in the community. This is no longer a case where we're still figuring this out, though some of the elements we're still figuring out, obviously. But we know that these proven practices, some of which Elizabeth talked about just a few minutes ago, and these are the things that we can put in place and we hope more jurisdictions will put in place. If they're already in place, we'd like more of these services. If they're not in place, we need to start putting them in, uh, in, 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 into place. So, with that, I'll turn it back to Bethany, and we'll see how much time we have for questions and what questions we should answer. Well, thank you both very much for that wonderful overview. Um, 
one of the questions that we've kind of gotten two different versions of and that somewhat stems out of uh, what you were just discussing, Mark, is around um, how to build interest, so to speak, um, and awareness in specifically judges seem to be the focus of some of these questions. But, you know, that they might not understand some of the challenges like the fact that individuals who are in a particular situation might not have access to health care coverage or that they just, um, uh, one of the questions framed it more as they don't particularly care about this. And I don't know if either of you have any thoughts or either of you have thoughts about how to um, address that. Well, I think it can be done. I think it's incredibly important that there be uh, discussions with court officers about these issues. And I think it can be done in a number of formal and informal ways. Um, I have found that courts, um, the, ju the judges, are often very troubled by the people that come before them and the sense of what do you do or the fact that somebody comes frequently before their court, or that the person doesn't seem to be getting the help that they so desperately need. So one simple strategy is to figure out ways to sit down and talk with the judge. Uh, I have called and had appointments with judges. They're very welcoming. They'll let you come into their office uh, and speak with them about what resources are available and what might be helpful to them. Uh, there are conferences that court officials have, and it's uh, possible to get onto the agenda of those conferences and be able to discuss what resources are available. Uh, and then, of course, there are the informal networks, people who know the judges and can have uh, informal conversations that up so that you can explain what you're doing. But I think it's definitely important and I think it's definitely possible to do. You just have to figure out the best way to access the court. The other thing that's important in that situation, I think, is it's really important to have you know, um, as much empirical data in support of your argument as possible. Um, if this is not something that you're doing in your jurisdiction, find examples in other jurisdictions. So for example, you know, one of the slides earlier, which we didn't touch on, talked about, you know, crisis services in Delaware. And, you know, they did a study as part of the settlement agreement, you know, and they found that the mobile crisis teams could divert 80 to 90 percent of people from hospitalization or contact with the criminal justice system. The walking crisis centers diverted a high percentage also, 70 percent uh, was the finding. So that's just one example. And if you can go into a court like the chief judge or a meeting of judges and say, look, you know, you have a lot of cases the court system is overwhelmed, prosecutors are overwhelmed, the public defenders are certainly overwhelmed. If you know anything about how public defenders work, there's generally not enough of them and they have high caseloads. So um, when you say to the, to the judge, look, here's a way that we can um, just have fewer cases and if we can create a system in which people can be diverted elsewhere. But it's not enough to go in and say this is a good idea and we really think this would be nice to do this. I think they'll be res more responsive and more likely to be responsive if you have empirical data to show, and it doesn't even have to be in a large scale, but just even on a small scale, that if this is tried, fewer people come through. And we do know and can provide data for the, for the notion that we're not talking about, for the most part, violent criminals. We're talking about people who are clogging up the courts and clogging up our jails uh, for very minor nonviolent offenses. As I mentioned very early in the presentation, quality of life offenses or other types of administrative offenses. So again, um, lining up the actual empirical data can make a huge difference. Good point. Thanks. So um, we've had a couple of questions about additional resources with regards to forensic peer support and uh, peers in emergency rooms. And we can follow up with folks after that, because I think Kelly is sending us a list of questions. So. Um, I'm going to instead turn to a very specific question we got that I think Mark should be able to answer fairly quickly, and that would be, how would Olmstead and the ADA be applied to people who haven't yet been diagnosed with a mental illness but might be, have one? Um, well, as a very practical matter, if um, you know, the ADA and Olmstead apply to people who have disabilities um, to the extent that um, somebody 
is, doesn't have a diagnosis of a disability and they would end up getting one if they went into the services and they'd have to be evaluated. Um, so I'm not sure in what context the question is being raised, but basically it's the law and Olmstead protect people with mental health disabilities. So if somebody um, either denies that they have a disability or has not been diagnosed as having a mental health disability, then they probably will not be in a situation where you know, ADA or Olmstead would apply. If you're talking about somebody who clearly has mental health needs but just doesn't have a, a formal um, diagnosis that would somehow get them into the mental health system where they live, then obviously they need to be evaluated. This, this happens in the jail system, for example, where people go in and people get evaluated there and they may never have had either an evaluation or if they've been evaluated, uh, they were not evaluated properly or for whatever reason. And so they may end up getting evaluated. And if you can show that you fit the criteria for a disability, you get protection under the law, whether or not you had a um, formal diagnosis. The, but the more common route is through a formal diagnostic process, either as an entry into the service system or, as I say, fairly commonly in jail, people end up in jail, and only then will they be diagnosed with um, some type of mental health needs, in which case the law then would apply to them there. And the question is, what services should they get? Uh, can they be diverted to something else? Obviously, if they're already in jail, we're talking about a later point in the process. But as I mentioned, there still should be a way to divert people out of jail, if at all possible. For example, when they go through a court appearance, is there a mental health court where this person is? Are there other ways, like social workers inform courts and public defenders about who might have a mental health diagnosis? So um, the law applies so long as you have um, a, 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 a mental illness, and um, so it's a matter of people finding out about that so they can apply whatever uh, services they need to, to apply. So we have another question um, related to the impact of um, sexually based criminal offenses and the impact that that might have on services like housing and if you have any particular strategies you might recommend to address that point. That, that is a challenging issue, and but, um, the people that I've spoken with who are responsible for finding housing for people and have, have dealt with that issue have managed it by developing relationships with landlords in properties that um, protect are protective of what uh, court orders have been put in place. For example, that children can't be nearby or their schools can't be nearby. Uh, it's been done largely through building relationships with the landlords after looking at what properties might fit those uh, required characteristics. Uh, it's limited. You know, everyone who has to work on this issue knows that that limits significantly what's available for housing. But again, it's the uh, relationship with the landlord and the reliability of the supports that are being provided to the person so that if there's an ACT team involved, for example, uh, the, act, it, the uh, landlord is clear that there's somebody that can be called and that will be promptly responsive if there's an issue. But again, acknowledging that is one of the harder issues people say. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so we have a couple more minutes, and um, I think I'll go with, uh, we have more questions. I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we've had several questions around kind of building trust, and you talked a lot about that and the specific challenges that people were talking about regarding re-traumatization via hospitalization, and um, there was a particular question about um, how service providers might be able to address this despite high caseloads that um, make it difficult to have additional time. Um, and I wasn't sure if you wanted to add anything to that point. Well, I, we, I remember when I talked about what was necessary at the beginning, I said there needed to be sufficient resources. And I think, and to have a waiting list for an ACT team, for example, is a problem. So again, I think this is where there needs to be the advocacy and the 
responsiveness of leadership and funding sources to make sure adequate resources are in place. We know these supports are effective, but they have to be there in order to be implemented. In terms of the relationship building, this is an issue that crosses over a lot of different parts of our work. Uh, if you're trying to work with someone who lives, uh, another Bazelon case that involves adult care homes where people will, were in, are institutionalized or being offered housing with supports, but after living in the adult care home for 30 years, it's very hard for people to make the decision uh, to leave and to try something new. Their confidence is eroded. Uh, institutionalization, whether it's in jail, a state hospital, or, or another form of an institution, has a tremendous impact on someone and their self-confidence and their, and their retention of skill. So what I have been um, advising people when I've been asked is that trusting relationships take time. And before you ask the most critical questions, like do you want to leave the institution and live in your own apartment, you have to spend time really getting to know the person, what their concerns are, what their fears are. You need to help people develop social networks by taking them places or seeing that they get experiences uh, with other people that are in the community that they share an interest in. Uh, some of the people that have been the most undecided or negative about change are people who really lack a social support system and they're worried about being lonely and left you know, left to themselves. So I think it needs a lot of time, it needs a lot of listening, it needs a lot of focus on what are the interests the person has and beginning to help them re-experience that before you start uh, asking you know, them to make decisions about things. And you need to stay in the relationship. Um, people are so used to having people come in and out of their lives that they need something that they can count on that's stable, that's reliable. And I think that's, you know, that's part of the effort is trying to help put that in place. Well, thank you both so much again. And I am sorry that we didn't get to all the questions, but um, Kelly will follow up with them. And when we can, we'll um, respond to those questions we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, Kelly? Yes, thanks, Bethany. And thank you so much, Mark and Elizabeth, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to turn the screen over to a short evaluation and ask that you all take the time to fill this out for us to let us know how you enjoyed today's uh, webinar. I would like to thank SAMHSA again for allowing us to share this information with you today. And thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs>